Welcome to the episode of the Let Fuel Prosper series. My name is Dr. Vance Gann. I hope you're having a prosperous day. Well, today is February 24th, 2023. Glad to have on a good friend and someone who else is a happy warrior for economic freedom and liberty and just does a lot of good work on the economy. Another good person to have on about what the public policy debate is all about, what's going on in the economy as a whole. And it's none other than Dr. Tyler Goodspeed. Tyler, welcome to the Let Fuel Prosper show. Great to be with you, Vance. Well, good. It's a, it's a pleasure, real pleasure to have you on. Um, we've known each other for a few, few years now, um, going back to the White House days, and we'll have some discussion about that. But before we get into our discussion here today, um, let me go ahead and give the audience your bio and your background. I think it's really important, as you've done a lot of a lot of good things. And so let me go ahead and start going through that here. Tyler is a Klein Hines Fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. From 2020 to 2021, he served as acting chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors at the White House, having been appointed by the president as a member of the council in 2019. In that role, he advised the administration's economic response to the coronavirus pandemic, as well as subsequent economic recovery packages. He previously served as the chief economist for macroeconomic policy and senior economist for tax, public finance, and macroeconomics, playing an instrumental role in designing the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act or TICJA, as we, we often called it there. Um, before joining the council, Dr. Goodspeed was on the, the Faculty of Economics at the University of Oxford and was a lecturer in economics at King's College, London. He has published extensively on financial regulation, banking, and monetary economics, with particular attention to the role of access to credit in mitigating the effects of an adverse environmental shocks in historical context. His research has appeared in three full-length monographs from academic presses, as well as numerous articles in peer-reviewed and edited journals. Goodspeed has a PhD in history from Harvard University and a PhD in economics from the University of Cambridge. He's also received a BA in economics and history from Harvard, an MA in history from Harvard, and a master in philosophy in economic history from Cambridge, where he was a Gates scholar. He is currently a member of the American Economic Association and the Economic History Association, an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute, and was previously a member of the Economic History Society and the Royal Economic Society. A lot of good stuff going on there, Tyler. The way that I like to start off each one of these episodes is to ask the guest, what motivates you? So, Tyler, what motivates you to do what you do every day? Well, I guess the, the short answer is that I enjoy it. <laughs> but uh, I guess there are sort of two things. On the, on the intellectual front, what motivates me is what I would call the application of history to contemporary questions and challenges in economics. Because I actually heard Ken Rogoff, Harvard professor, former chief economist of the International Monetary Fund, I actually heard him put it quite well once, that even if we have the perfect model of how the economy works, you still need to, to calibrate that model using real world data. And that's really hard to do with a lot of rare events like a, a global financial crisis, like a pandemic, because these things are not normally distributed. And so it's really hard to calibrate it on, on normal data. And history provides some sense of, of how these events might unfold, what the, traje what the trajectory might be. And history also gives us a sense of the evolution of institutions governing economic activity, because we tend to look around at the institutions uh, that govern economic activity today, and we kind of have this assumption that, well, they, they're here because there was like a natural progression, a natural evolution. And that kind of ignores a lot of the historical contingency of institutional development, that there were political constraints, and then you get these sort of quick fixes or these patches and what is doesn't that didn't necessarily evolve logically. It, it, it evolved in political context. And so that's sort of the intellectual side of things. In terms of the more policy-oriented side, there's just so much that you can do when you have a more prosperous society. And one thing that really strikes me whenever I so I lived in, in the UK for the better part of a decade. Love the UK, uh, love love going to, to Western Europe. One thing that really I think a lot of us don't realize is just the extent of the income and wealth gap between the United States and other advanced economies like in Western Europe. It's it's a 30 to 40 percent gap. That's really that's really big. And when you go and you live in a Western European country, you realize that just the, the basket of goods that you can afford to buy at any given point in the income distribution is just smaller. And that just means you can 
you know, not only are you less prosperous, but the things that you can afford to do when you're more prosperous, like if you care about climate, if you care about other issues, you can afford to tackle those uh, much more readily. And so I think seeing some of those gaps around the world really makes one appreciate the importance of a set of policies that deliver economic prosperity. Yeah, no, great answer. Tyler, whenever you got on your track with economics, was there a spark? Was there something that you read? Was it a, a teacher? What got you on the track to economics? Good question. I, one of my early mentors was a uh, Harvard labor economist, James Medoff. And that was sort of my, the, the first class that really activated my interest. It was about labor economics and I remember one one class in particular really appealed to me, and or one one lecture in particular really struck me. And it was when he was going over introducing the concept of the beverage curve, which relates the, the number of job openings to the number of unemployed workers. And in a perfectly efficient labor market, you you can't have you're not going to have the simultaneous existence of both open jobs and unemployed workers because then any new job is going to be immediately filled. By an unemployed worker. And so you can tell something about the efficiency of a labor market by how far from that, that zero point you are. And that sort of gets into this whole issue of, of institutional economics, because, well, what are the rigidities that can diminish the efficiency of labor market matching? And so I liked how, how Medoff sort of combined both the formal mathematical and, 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 and econometric methods of, of economics with this, this, this understanding of the institutional context with which, within which markets operate. And funny enough, just a year and a half ago, I found myself returning to the beverage curve. Uh, and it was part one of the reasons why I anticipated a lot of the inflationary pressure that we saw, that we've seen over the past two years. And it was because we were pouring so much stimulus on a U.S. labor market that was was not in healthy shape. I mean, the, the beverage curve was had shifted way out because of pandemic-related supply disruptions, because of early retirements, a whole bunch of issues. And I think the beverage curve was sort of flashing flashing red at the very moment that we were pouring all that stimulus on. Yeah, that that's fascinating, especially given the job openings that have been out there now, the number of unemployed um, and everything else that's going on to kind of start off with with that <laughs> um, plays in so many respects today of what's happening. So you're exactly right with those trade offs that go on. And that's something we study a lot, right? In economics, it's it's, it's all about trade offs and this, the scarcity of resources that's around us the institutional frameworks that, that are in place. I talk a lot about that on the Let People Prosper show. Um, my mentor, uh, Dr. Ronald Gilbert at Texas Tech University was the first one that really got that spark going for me in intermediate macro, um, talking about monetary theory, actually, of all things. And uh, I remember after one of our classes, he handed me the book, Capitalism and Freedom by Milton Friedman, right? And he was like, you should read this. I think you'll like it a lot. And then that got me going on a, in a whole other path compared to what I was doing before. It's something had those little things to a lot of people will will spark that interest to really get you going in a certain way. Um, it, it's pretty, quite fascinating. Well, you know, with your other your background and your your research that you've done and your time at the White House, that's where we met. I got there in June 2019 and was there until May of 2020. You were there, you know, a, a while before that and a while after. Um, it, it was quite fascinating to kind of see the the day to day actions that are going on within the White House and the amount of information that you have access to, the great people that are on staff. Um, but what are some of your kind of key memories and insights from, from your time at the White House? Gosh, where to, where to start? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I think that the several of the, the key memories and moments were related to the pandemic and also the 2017 tax law. And, and with the pandemic, I think it was... It was just, it was a very stressful time and it was a very frightening time because we were seeing this incoming data. And I remember working on the, the, the data memo to the president that would report the biggest job loss in US history, the biggest economic contraction in US history, the biggest job gain in US history, the biggest economic rebound in US history, it's so just the, the magnitude of the numbers that we were dealing with was staggering. 
and the, the scramble to stand up appropriate economic policy to deal with some of the the collateral damage of the public health, <laughs> the, the the public health interventions. You know, we were we were moving very quickly. And I think in retrospect, we did a lot of good policy to preserve the matches of of workers and jobs. And I think that the, the, the two key signature pieces of economic policy there were the employee retention tax credit and and PPP, the the, the, the program to provide forgivable loans to the, small and medium sized businesses if they kept yep. workers on, on the on the books. Yeah, the paycheck protection program. Mm-hmm. Yep. yep. Um, and on the, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act front, I remember getting a lot of incoming hostility from members, alums, alumni of the, of the Obama administration in particular, criticizing the, the, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, saying it was not going to do anything for growth, that it would be a reckless policy. And then it was just great confirmation. It, it was a great exercise in science because my former colleague, Kevin Hassett, and I, we put out a lot of estimates of what the effects of, of the 2017 tax law would be, wage estimates, growth estimates. And it was kind of cool to see that those, those estimates, those predictions tested and to empirically be upheld by the data. And you're probably very familiar with a lot of this data. But in 2018, 2019, we were seeing real income gains, real growth gains, real investment responses that really corroborated what we in the Trump administration have predicted would be the effects of that 2017 tax law. Yep, no, that's exactly right. And I think when you look at the other data in 2019, that most people were, were saying, oh, this isn't going to work. It's not going to have as much growth. We had the lowest poverty rate on record across demographics, right? Um, and with the highest real median household income o- on record. Um, and, and it was quite fascinating to see the, gr- the growth that happened. But, but more importantly, I think, you know, Tyler, is that the, the lowest, the, the neediest among us were some of the ones that benefited the most. And I think some of the research that y'all were doing at the Council of Economic Advisors was, was showing those benefits kind of in real time of, of what was happening and what those growth effects were. Do you remember some of those? I do. So on the investment side, we, we estimated that the, the, the business tax provisions in the 2017 tax law would actually raise business investment by about 9%. And sure enough, if you if you estimated a trend in business investment before the 2017 tax law, projected that trend into 2018, 2019, and then calculated the difference between the, the projected trend and actual investment, actual investment was about 10% above that projected trend. When you look at wage growth, uh, wage growth for the bottom 10th of the of the, the wage distribution was more than was about double that of the top 10% of the wage distribution. And the reason for, for that is because at the end of the day, the incidence, the, the economic incidence of any tax tends to fall disproportionately on the less mobile factor of production. Well, in, in today, in today's day and age, that is that is not capital. That is not high-skilled labor, which are very mobile. That is that is lower skilled labor. Uh, because it, it can't move. And so lower skilled labor tends to bear the burden of a lot of taxes like corporate income taxation. And that, I think that's part of the reason why we were starting to see those big job gains, those big wage gains, income gains uh, that were disproportionately concentrated at the lower end of the distribution. Yeah, those are great points there, Tyler. And I think it does, kind of, as you were saying, it, it kind of solidified what you were already putting out there in these memos and everything else. And there's so much that goes along, goes on, you know, at the White House. Things are moving so fast. Um, you were always one of the ones that I love to go and talk to, bounce off ideas, because um, it, you know, people may think that everyone in the White House is very political. I, I would say you are not very political. Um, that we would have good just economic discussions. Now we come at it from a uh, a basis. Uh, our assumptions are such that if you cut taxes, incentives matter, right? You're going to have more growth and things of that nature. If you cut deregulations or if you deregulate, you'll have more growth. Those are assumptions that are put in place. Not necessarily. Those are more from economics, though, not from political assumptions. Um, there are a lot of folks that are also much more political, but we tried to keep 
things based on sound economics. You know, for example, we were on Troika, uh, right? The the chief economist from OMB, which was my position, chief economist from Council of Economic Advisors, your your position, um, and then was it the assistant secretary of the Treasury, uh, Michael Falkender, another one of our good friends, um, was there, and we would have some really good discussions, bouncing off ideas on the economic projections that would go in the president's budget for the next ten year window, um, and. It was interesting, some of those discussions too, right, uh, Tyler, is that you you have these discussions about the Phillips curve and what those trade-offs are. Um, you have the ideas about what the tax cuts are going to do. Um, and a lot of this, of course, over 10 years is kind of a, a guess, but we really tried to build in sound economics, the trade-offs that are going to happen as much as possible. And you know, now what I'm seeing kind of out of the, uh, the Biden administration is that there's there's no real anticipation for growth um, from the folks that are coming at the Council of Economic Advisors, the CBO numbers. I mean, they're talking about one percent, two percent growth. There's just not the, the there's not the same emphasis on growth as there are the redistribution. And from your research and your time at the White House and others, um, do you really see that there is a trade off between growth and redistribution? To be honest, I think growth growth enables more redistribution if, if redistribution is what you care about. I I tend to be in the the, the, the Maggie Thatcher camp that uh, you know I would rather I would rather the gap be up here than than smaller but down here. And um, I would just add that you know on, on to your point about policy making in economic policy making in the White House. I when I arrived at the at the White House, I, I received some helpful advice from former CEA chair Eddie Lazier, hmm. and and that was because basically we asked him, you know, how uh, we're academics, how how do we use our comparative advantage uh, in this this sort of environment in a political environment? And he basically said, stick to your comparative advantage, hmm. that no one belongs in a room or belongs in a meeting simply by virtue of your position. People have to want you in the meeting. People have to want you in the room. And, and I think what I realized was that people wanted CEA, they wanted me in the room to provide objective economic advice, objective economic analysis. And if we weren't there to do that, then there really wasn't a reason for us to be in the room. So I think that was a that was really helpful advice from, from Eddie early on. Yeah, d- definitely. And when was it that you joined the White House? What year was that? So I joined the White House in September of 2017. It was only supposed to be for a year, but a year became two years, two years became three, three and a half. <laughs> yeah. The other thing that you're mentioning there about the the pandemic, right? And um, you and I had a lot of conversations at that time about what it was going to do to the, the economy. Um, there was some estimates of where the spread was going to go. Um, and and how that was going to influence different segments of the economy, um, you know whether or not we were going to shut down and the states were going to shut down and and have that sort of effect. I remember you know, pretty clearly um, some of my moments of being in the Situation Room and having those conversations about what this was going to do to the economy. You talked about earlier about the huge swings that we saw in the data. But even before that, there was a lot of these discussions that were happening amongst the the highest ranking folks and some of the smartest people that I that I've ever met. And um, it was it was quite extraordinary, that whole period of time. And when you look at that situation and the shutdowns, the supply chain issues, um, the massive expenditures, you know, um, spending bills that came out of Congress that we were kind of instrumental in at the White House as well, and like the CARES Act and Families First Act and others, some of those first few. Um, I mean, we're talking about a massive amount of money. If you look at from Jan- January, 2020, to now, um, it's a, it's about a little over seven trillion dollars that has been added to the national debt, which is thirty one trillion dollars now. So a lot of money put into the economy from in that sense. Um, but then also the Federal Reserve, right, monetized a, a lot of that as their balance sheet went from about four trillion dollars to nine trillion. It's down some about six and a half percent now from their high of uh, you know la- last April of twenty twenty two. But a lot of money was put into the economy, and so from my perspective, you were talking earlier about the beverage curve, which I. I'm not as um, familiar with it or as educated in it as you, so I wasn't looking at that. 
I was looking at it more from a monetary sense, given more of that, my background of you have so much money in the economy that the Fed has put in there. You have supply that's being restrained, not only by supply chain issues, but also, you know, the regulations that have been put in place the last couple of years by the Obama administration, especially energy regulations, higher taxes, the, the, the spending that I think could be anti-growth if you're restricting people's decision to go back into or hindering the decision to go back in the labor force. So you had too much money chasing too few goods. In my view, Tyler, this was this was always going to be more persistent inflation. But within the economic community, and I don't know where you were at on this, but there was some discussion about transitory versus persistent. And I'd love to get your thoughts on how all that works, because um, I always enjoy hearing you explain things. And I think that it would be good to know your the way you were thinking about all this whenever that's been going over the last couple of years. Right. So I think the way, well, the way I was thinking about it was basically adding up the real productive potential of the U.S. economy in 2021. How many, how many people were, are, how many workers are there? What is the, the contribution of capital services? What are average hours? And basically using all that information to come up with a sense of, okay, what, what is the productive potential of the U.S. economy? Another way to do that would maybe just look at what the Congressional Budget Office had projected would be production, productive potential of the U.S. economy before the pandemic, and then maybe adjust that a little bit. Because since that forecast had been made by the Congressional Budget Office, we had 1.5, by my estimations, we had 1.5 million Americans over the age of 55 take early retirement. We had a cumulative shortfall of business investment of, I think it was about a half a trillion dollars. We had a lot of dysfunction in the labor market that you had places like Texas and Florida that had reopened earlier and they had much stronger labor market recoveries. Whereas you had places like New York and California, which reopened much later. And it's not easy to move unemployed workers from California to, to, to Florida. And so just looking at all that stuff, I saw a supply side of the U.S. economy that was still in recovery mode. And then on the demand side, as you noted, we, we had we'd had a lot of, of, of stimulus in 2020 when the economy was, was shut down. And so a lot of, there, was, there was a lot of above trend savings that households were sitting on already heading into 2021. And then in 2021, we have another fiscal stimulus equal in March 2021, equal to 10% of the annual output of the entire U.S. economy. So that is just a, a massive stimulus to demand at the same time that the supply side of the U.S. economy is, is still recovering. So, so you would have been pretty close to accurate in terms of predicting inflation if you just looked at the supply side potential of the U.S. economy and then the, the nominal stimulus to demand and then take that gap would give you about what inflation was in, in 2021. And I think the problem is that policymakers were slow to recognize this. So they, they continued to keep their, their feet, you know, multiple feet on multiple gas pedals uh, throughout 2021. And the, the problem is that once you have a big shock like that, a big inflationary shock like that, that lasts several quarters, then people start to expect inflation. We actually saw this in, in the 1960s and 1970s, where you had big shocks in, I think it was Q1, 1966, Q, Q2, and Q4, 73, I think it was, and then Q1, 74, I might be off by a couple quarters, uh, but you had those big shocks, and then you get an inflationary psychology. And once expectations shift, then you get a lot of in, embedded inflation, and it's really difficult to wring that out of the system. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And we're, I guess we're seeing some of that now. You know, PCE inflation was um, released today. Was it five point seven percent year over year? But just the monthly was uh, a point uh, was a point six percent. So we're we're seeing still massive inflation that's that's embedded in there. Even the core, excluding food and energy, is up. You know, um, quite a bit as well near you know near these forty year highs. Um, and this expectation is also built in. If you take in some of the the surveys that are out there now, is that you know people are expecting inflation to remain high for a while. One of the measures that I've been looking at a lot is um, back to the Fed's balance sheet. <laughs> uh, it, is that the Fed's balance sheet is only down six and a half percent? Now it is down, which is something that's kind of historic. This doesn't happen very often. So that could that's I think going to help with some of these inflationary pressures that are out there. But I just don't really see anything to your other point, Tyler, about 
the supply side of the economy. I mean, I don't see that the president's going to sign any sort of big tax bill that maybe the House of Republicans, you know, the, the majority of Republicans in the House would pass um, that would allow to free up some of that supply side of the economy. And uh, and it seems like instead of us, when we were there, the White House um, deregulating a lot of things, there is more and more regulations that are being added on, whether it be from the green energy agenda, the banking policy, the ESG sort of stuff. I mean, there's a lot of things that's going on that I just don't see the supply side of the economy being really, being really freed up to bring down inflation for a longer period of time. I think the Fed's going to have a tough time really holding down this disinflationary period that we really need. But, but what are some what are your thoughts? Yeah, so I I, I just finished a, a paper that, that's currently under review. Um, hopefully gets published soon. Um, but it's, so. it's looking at basically 60 years of inflation expectations in the US. So going all the way back to, to 1960. And who does a better job predicting inflation? Experts, professional economists, or consumers. And it turns out it de depends on the inflation regime. So when, when inflation is low and stable, the pros do a pretty good job, but when, and the consumers do terrible. Uh, the, the, the consumers just aren't paying attention to inflation. They're underreacting to recent inflation news, and they're expecting that recently observed changes in inflation are completely offset by future change, equal and opposite future changes in inflation. But when inflation gets above about three and a half percent, the pros do terribly because the pros keep expecting inflation to go back down. And the Federal Reserve economists uh, were the worst, actually, uh, of any of the pros back in the 1960s, 70s, 80s. Uh, they, they were the worst at predicting inflation. Uh, but the consumers suddenly start doing really, really well. They're reacting rationally to recent inflation news. They're unbiased. Uh, and they no longer expect recently observed changes to be offset by equal and opposite future changes, which means... When history happens, like an oil shock, price shock, like you know an invasion of a sovereign country, like a you know supply chain bottleneck, then you get this instant ratchet effect because consumers instantly incorporate that price shock into their expectations. I think that's why it's a really tough job for the Fed once you have that embedded inflation, what those embedded inflation expectations. It's really hard to, for the Fed. To, to, to get that back down to to two percent to the two percent target because it's it's just embedded in in wage negotiations in price negotiations and uh, so yeah I think that the I think the Fed is is in a, is in a tricky spot here yeah I, I think so too and the other facet that we have to put into all this now is that the net interest on the debt will soon um, be above a trillion dollars. You know, the CBO, even with their projections, um, they're showing that the deficits could could be about two trillion dollars annually. Right. So, I mean, we're, we're expecting to have more and more deficits over time. Um, this is something that's really going to have to be taken care of by Congress, I think, in, in controlling spending. And, you know, you know me, like I'm always big on spending limits. So I would love for there to be a spending limit at the federal level. Um, I think that that would really help to rein in the growth of spending and also help with our deficits moving forward. But you really need growth. I mean, <laughs> it's difficult, like Larry Cullo would always say, right? You've got to have growth. <laughs> um, and we need that growth again to also help with our deficits. But this is going to put pressure on the Fed because as interest rates go, you know, go up and, and these, this net interest on the debt is going to go up, that's going to crowd out more of the federal budget. And that's going to put more pressure on the um, uh, interest rates to rise, crowding out the economy. So the Fed's going to want to hold interest rates down so that they may have to print more money to put in the economy, which is inflationary as well. And, and so this is going to be a tough situation. And we've seen some mortgage rates start to come down a little bit. Um, housing market has been coming down. The valuations are coming down some. Um, and, and so I wonder, as, as, we, as we wrap up here, Tyler, kind of where do you see things moving forward? And, and what kind of optimism, though, can you bring to really that we can find ways to let people prosper? Right. So on the we, we, on the first question, the probability in any given year, the probability that the U.S. economy enters a recession is about 16 percent, 16, 17 percent. And looking at 2023, 2024, do I think that the risks to the outlook are greater or less than or equal to the typical probabil probability? I'd say they're considerably greater. And even if it's 
two times normal risk, that would place the odds of a recession at one in three. If we think that the, the risks translate into a three times greater probability of a recession, of, of a recession then that's 51% probability. Uh, in any event, I think that we're looking at a period of, of low growth. And when, when we look at the GDP data at the end of 2022 and look at the inertial components of that, that was showing really anemic growth, uh, so not a lot of momentum heading into 2023. And there's still this inflation challenge. Uh, inflation will probably come down with the lagged effects of the Fed's tightening. But for those reasons that I just mentioned about expectations, I think it's, it's a long way from where we are now back to 2%. And history happens. <laughs> Uh, so I think that, that the Fed are kind of hoping that 2023 will be a boring year, and maybe they'll get a boring year, but I wouldn't bank on it. In terms of optimism, I think what does make me optimistic is that we've sort of been in this debt situation before in 1945, when our debt to GDP ratio was above 100%. And over the next 20 years, quarter century, that came down substantially, and it came down for some not so good reasons, like a bit of surprise inflation, a bit of what we call financial repression, uh, basically artificially trying to keep interest rates low. But it also came down because of some budget surpluses, the occasional budget surplus, and it came down because of very strong growth. And we had a lot of growth tailwinds then. We had historically very strong productivity growth for reasons that we can't fully explain. Uh, that's sort of the nature of, of productivity growth. Uh, we also had a lot of, of tailwinds coming from rising labor force participation and a growing working age population. So I don't necessarily anticipate those tailwinds today, but we can. there's a lot that policy can do to encourage that. There are a lot of policy decisions that we can make that would incentivize increased labor force participation, uh, which has been on a secular downward trend for the past few decades. There are policies that we can do to incentivize increased domestic capital formation so that we get increased output flowing from more plant and equipment. And there's also something about you know, more, more people working, more people working with more equipment, more and better equipment that kind of leads to a virtuous circle of, of productivity growth such that for reasons we can't fully explain, you also get higher what we call total factor productivity growth. So it's sort of the part of productivity growth that we can't really explain, but we get more of it when we when we bring a lot of these other inputs to it into employment. And I think we saw some of those dynamics already manifesting in, in 2019, where we had productivity growth was rising, we had rising labor force participation, uh, in fact, in, in, the, in three years uh, during the Trump administration, we saw 2.3 million prime age workers enter or, or re-enter the labor force. We saw three quarters of the flows into employment uh, consisting of people coming in from out, out of the labor force. So, you know, I think that's the cause for optimism. That's the rationale for optimism is that good policy can generate the sorts of tailwinds that we saw uh, back in 1945 to, to 1970. Yeah, no, great points, Tyler. I, I agree with you. Uh, I'm hopeful that we can get to a good policy again. Um, and I'm glad that there are folks like you, Tyler, who are working on these things and will hopefully be there again, you know, whenever the, the time calls for us to have those opportunities um, to have more growth and, and more opportunity for people to be more prosperous, because that's really what we need to have again, instead of kind of this malaise that seems to be uh, among people, we really need to have that growth and optimism for the future. And so um, I just like to say thank you for your service, Tyler, to 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 America and for the, all the work you do and the, and the research and everything else that you do. Um, God bless you and your family. And um, for the audience, they, please give us a rating of five star if you would um, subscribe. You can also find the show notes at vanceskin.com or my newsletter, vanceskin.substack.com. Thank you for joining us today. And until next time, let people prosper. 